Hey, everybody. Before we start our interview with Rosaria Butterfield today, I just wanted to say thank you for all of you who have written in to give us encouraging words and tell, tell us how the stories that we're sharing together are impacting you in your own life. And um, we've gotten recently, we've gotten a lot of um, comments on our Apple podcast, which if you haven't had a chance to go write something there, we would really appreciate it. Or just a rating, just a star rating would be great too. Um, when you do that, it actually allows, it, it puts our podcast out there a little bit more and people, it makes it easier to discover our podcast. So we are super grateful for that. But I wanted to read this one that's really encouraging um, to both Aaron and I. It says, this podcast broadens the typical conversations surrounding womanhood and reaches into the heart of what it means to learn, lead, and love. It leaves me thoughtful and inspired and thankful to be a woman. And I mean, just the fact that this person said, this makes me thankful to be a woman is so encouraging to us because that is one of the big things that we want our listeners to come away with. And it's definitely something Aaron and I are learning is just that gratefulness that God made us on purpose. As Kathy Cook says, she's one of our, our friends. He made us on purpose with a purpose. And, and it's not a mistake that we were designed in his image as women. And so anyway, thanks everybody for all the feedback. It's super encouraging and very humbling. And um, we, ha- I, we know that you're going to enjoy this conversation today. Yeah. So let me introduce our next guest on the podcast. Um, Her name is Rosaria Butterfield. And if you don't know Rosaria, she is an author, a speaker, a pastor's wife, a homeschool mom, and a former professor of English and women's studies at Syracuse University. Um, She's the author of three books that we want to tell you about, The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, and openness unhindered and the third book which we're talking to her about today that sarah and i read and just loved is called the gospel comes with the house key so rosaria thank you so much for being on the podcast today oh thank you thank you so much for including me and sarah i just love 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 what that uh, listener said about being thankful for being a, a woman, I, I think that that is so key. That it's the you know it really is that the this uh, false idea that men and women are interchangeable, that is really tripping up a lot of uh, men and women right now. I know it certainly tripped me up for many many years, and mm-hmm. and it's it's a gospel imperative. The ontology of of our sexual difference is. Uh, profound. And I would say it's actually quite central to the gospel. This is not a, you know, just sort of a throwaway. We're going to, we are men and women right now, and we're going to be men and women in the new Jerusalem. That doesn't change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not comrades in Christ people. Uh, It's, it's, that's not the case. So I really appreciated that. That's something I'd I'd love. I hope that that's something we'll be able to dig into. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, it's kind of an obvious fact, right? But but it's not at this moment. And it's, it's so freeing to, mm-hmm. if, if our culture could grab onto the fact that differences are beautiful and mm-hmm. that God mm-hmm. designed us male and female for a reason mm-hmm. that's life-giving and it frees from the lies of the, that the culture are giving. And so I just, I, it's so meaningful. Yeah, it is. But every every generation has had to defend the gospel anew on some turf. Mm-hmm. And I'd say probably every generation is like, oh, do we have to talk about this? I'm going to talk about that. Well, guess what? We get to talk about this. Yeah. So and this is something that every every woman listening to this podcast can um, with a pretty short amount of faithful study be able to give a defense of the hope that lies within her in the context of uh, the high value of, of, of being a woman. And I would add to that, if the Lord calls you being a wife and being a mother and being really unapologetic mm-hmm. about the, the, the role of being a, a helper and a wise counselor um, and, and, um, and a sacrificial mother. Those, those yeah. are not things to apologize for. Those are things to celebrate and encourage. Mm-hmm. Well, I love your, your passion, Rosaria, on this topic. And we know because we've read your book that 
this passion comes from your story. So I would love for our listeners to hear your story and, and we'll just start at the beginning of just, if you could just describe to us the home you grew up in, where you grew up and whether or not it was a religious family or not, and just give people that background for us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, f- first of all, I'm named after the rosary. My name is Rosaria. That's Italian for rosary. Um, so I, I am from an Italian Catholic family. Um, both of my parents though were unbelievers. I was educated in Catholic schools until the very last year of high school though. And my father would drop me off and say, uh, don't get in trouble with the nuns, do everything they say and don't believe a word they say. So I was, I was actually raised by, by two really uh, smart and committed religious skeptics. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and so, um, you know, skipping ahead many, many, many years, when I came out as a lesbian, which was uh, something I did uh, in, in graduate school, uh, actually, I was 28. And um, when I came out as a lesbian, that did not actually rock my parents' world. Hmm. Um, when I came out as a Christian years later, that did. And so, you know, sometimes we like to talk about these issues of sexuality and sexual difference and faith and life. And we act as though they all kind of live in this little bubble and they don't, they don't. Um, um, My experience as a lesbian was not disconnected in any way from my experience as a feminist, raised by a feminist, you know, all of that. So, um, so anyway, that, that, so that's it. So I, I, um, um, in, in college I dated men and, um, and I even fell in, I even fell in love with, with, um, with some of my boyfriends, no question, but I, I often, if not always found myself, um, uh, dating men and, and falling more enmeshed and in love with, um, with, with women. Um, and I'm using the word in love in the way that the culture uses in love. I'm not suggesting uh, that all love is, is, is equal. Um, and then when I was in graduate school, I said you know, to myself, well, we're just, we're done with this roller coaster. And so I, I came out as a lesbian and, um, and really at that point, life finally came together and made sense to me. And I thought, well, okay, well, this is you know, who I am. This makes sense now. Um, and, um, and then I was, you know, I was, I don't know, happy and uh, purposeful and functional. And um, fast forward now, finishing up graduate school, I, I landed a great job at uh, Syracuse University. And I was, um, I was recruited and uh, mentored and then finally tenured in a, a burgeoning field of critical theory called queer theory. So. This was 1999 and I was one of the first crop of of what we would call tenured radicals. And that would be people with a a radical worldview Mm -hmm. who had the best job in the world and complete permanent job security. Um, And my my sole purpose really was to teach and to write and to speak, um, which are things I've always loved to do. Mm -hmm. But then that same year, um, I met Christ. And uh, what I say in one of my books is I lost everything but the dog. Um, (laughs) And that's sort of true. It kind of gives people the wrong impression. I actually did not lose my job because I had tenure. I'm not saying that that would work, you know, today, but it worked back in 1999 (laughs) that I could defend um, because really the university was a very postmodern pluralistic one right now. The university clarity question. Yeah. 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 Um, So you, um, like you're losing everything before you became a Christian or no or after no, you became a Christian? No, when I met Christ. They still have to put up with you because They still have to put up with okay. me because I'm tenured. Yeah, and in fact, I, I taught courses. I It was just, I mean, I was just a laughing stock in some ways. I, I went from teaching courses in queer theory to teaching courses in biblical hermeneutics. <laughs> I know, <laughs> see, Sarah, it even makes you laugh. Yes. yes. But you know what? people took my classes. And some of the people who took my classes were my former students. Can you imagine 
how tragic it would be. And I really mean this seriously, that when one person comes to Christ, there are all these people around that person who have not come to Christ who just have the cross and nothing and not, none of the benefits. You know, I had students who traveled internationally to work on doctoral dissertations and queer theory with me. And now I'm just, you know, reading and writing about Christian hermeneutics. Mm. I mean, that basically means your, your career is just down the toilet in, you know, the time that took your, for your plane to land. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's something that I, I, I'm, I, I have seriously never forgotten. And I, I still struggle with what my responsibility is in, in, mm. in these ways, because um, I betrayed a lot of people by coming to Christ. Mm. Uh, you know, I wasn't the lesbian next door who sold, you know, car insurance. I was a speaker at gay pride marches. I was a leader in LGBTQ um, curricula. I uh, was the co-author of the university's first domestic partnership policy, which is the programmatic forerunner to gay marriage. I was as deep in the belly as you could get. And so when I came to Christ, in fact, I really didn't even have to do much but shut up and God used that powerfully. In fact, I've often thought <laughs> God uses my silence more powerfully than my speech anyway. Um, <laughs> That's humbling, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. It is. It is. Okay, so but you guys, you have to tell us, like, rewind the story a bit because yeah, how, how did a tenured radical, right? right. Yeah. How did right, that right, happen? Right. Yeah. Well, I wrote, I wrote an article that uh, the, the Syracuse Post Standard used as, a, you know, a a full page editorial and, and they gave it the title promise keepers message is a danger to democracy. Uh, mm -hmm. The Christian men's group, the promise keepers came to Syracuse. They used the university, which made me and all of my colleagues very mad. And when I found out who these jokers were, I was very mad. And so I wrote an article, you know, uh, exposing them. Right. Um, you know, and, um, and I got, I got tons of, you know, feedback from this. I got hate mail, I got fan mail. And if you know anything about me, you know that hate mail and fan mail both feel just as awkward to me. Like, I just don't <laughs> want to have either. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but one letter was, was, uh, was just so hard to file. And it was from Ken Smith, who was then the pastor of the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church in Syracuse, New York. And he wrote me this letter and he, uh, it was a very thoughtful letter. It was an intelligent letter. I knew he disagreed with me, but you know, he wasn't treating me like an idiot or a blank slate or I don't know what. And I wasn't sure what to do with this art, with this letter. And, and, and a colleague of mine came in and said, how are you doing? And I said, well, you know, I just got this letter from this, this pastor and I'm not sure what to do with it. And he looked at the letter my colleague did. And he said, well, Rosaria, aren't you, aren't you working on a book right now about why the religious right hates queer people? And I said, well, yes, actually I am. He said, well, go talk to this guy. This is your unpaid research assistant. And I thought, oh, that's a really excellent point. So, um, so I called him up <clears throat> and, um, and I went to his house for dinner and I met his lovely wife, Floyd. And it was the strangest experience. I mean, it had been so long since I had been, <clears throat> you know, in a house where, I don't know, there was like, you know, a mom and a dad and, you know, just, just all of the trappings of the things that we as Christians just take so for granted. Mm -hmm. um, and Ken and Floyd were simply lovely. I mean, Floyd was certainly a submitted helper but she was smart as a tack and you could tell that she took the wise counselor part really seriously and and ken was very much of a you know a, a um i mean he was a patriarch there's no way to, to but he was the nicest patriarch i had ever met and i couldn't i couldn't put my finger on this and so um uh, you know, we we actually got to be to be friends, and about five hundred dinners later, I came to Christ. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I say that because it's I, I don't know, I'm not a numbers person. Maybe it was four hundred and twenty nine, but you know, <laughs> it was up there, right? It was yeah. up there for you know for for years and years, week after week. Um, I had dinner at the Smith House. And they shared with me the gospel. They shared with me their lives. They shared with me their church community. Um, 
they patiently answered my questions. Um, you know, I told them I wanted to read the Bible, but I don't want to believe it. And they're like, oh yeah, no problem. Here, we'll help you. <laughs> you know, and now married to a Reformed Presbyterian pastor, I'm fairly convinced that there are so few people who say, I want to read the Bible, that pastors will just say, okay, I don't care why. <laughs> the word of God is more powerful. It'll do whatever it needs to do with you. Um, and so I actually, I, I did, I should say that, that I read the Bible seven times through before I came to Christ. And wow. I was on a sabbatical, My, you know, I'm an English professor, right? So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like a sociology guy. I can't just go to a promise keepers rally and, you know, put the microphone under somebody's mouth and say, how do you feel about blah, blah, blah. You know, I, it was my job to read this book that I thought got all these well-meaning people in trouble. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was on a sabbatical and I was reading um, when I'm, you know, back in the old days, when you would have a sabbatical, you would just read all day. So I was reading the Bible sometimes five hours a day. You know what? That gives the Holy Spirit a lot of room in the life of anybody. It really does. And so as I was reading, I had to confront a lot of things. Um, one was that I started with a couple of, I don't know, maybe five different, you know, concerns I had about the Bible that I thought were just like dead ringers. But they all, they all unraveled right in front of me as I was reading. And then um, Ken gave me some additional things to read about, um, well, certainly about hermeneutics, but also about um, um, the authenticity and the authority of the manuscripts. And, you know, it, it was a very heady time, but it was a crucial time. And, um, you know, and the Lord obviously just, he just used that. You know, the Lord uses everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, as much as I'm often embarrassed by my testimony, I'd love to tell you that, you know, I just, you know, woke up one day and said, oh, I, you know, got to have a V8 and I'm in the wrong direction and I need to go this way. You know, one of the things Ken Smith always says is you can't move a parked car. So even people who are running in the wrong direction, at least are moving, <laughs> you know, so, so that was, um, that was really helpful, but, um, one of the things I, 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 you know, you realize a lot of things over the course of, um, of a conversion experience, but, you know, two things I, I'd say that were my big takeaways. One was that, um, you know, I really thought I was on the side of justice and mercy and compassion and, and standing with the disempowered. And so it was really shocking to realize that actually it was Jesus I was persecuting the whole time. And he was the only one who can stand with the disempowered in a way that is useful. So that was a really powerful thing mm -hmm. to realize. And another powerful thing to realize was that there's no shame in repentance. That was shocking to me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that, that repentance is, uh, it's, 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 it's freeing because what it, all it says is that um, you don't measure up, Christ measures up for you. And, um, and you are sincere in your love for him and, um, and sincere in your appreciation that he is unscaling your eyes and allowing you to see things from his perspective. Um, and we all uh, know that we don't measure up. I mean, that's no, like, no, God never calls that. the worthy. No, but he never calls the worthy. Yeah. It's shameful. Yeah. Like we feel, I think it's the shame that keeps us from, and the worry that maybe, what if we apologize and there's no forgiveness at the end? Yeah. But, but repentance there, is such a gift, isn't it? Like it, you can fully be known and fully forgiven. Right. Absolutely. And it, and it's the only, it's the threshold to God. It's the only way, mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you don't bypass repentance to get to grace. It doesn't, but you know, the highway, there's no exit on the highway like that. You can't, you can't get there. So, you know, that was really, that was really, powerful too. And, and I think too, it was also powerful to realize how many people were praying for me. <laughs> because when I came out as a Christian, you know, I was probably the most hated person, you know, from the LGBTQ community in my lovely LGBTQ community in New York, right? But that's when I realized that, you know, the janitor who would come in and change my garbage every day, he was a Christian, he was praying for me. That's when I realized these people who were just just there and, and it, it's it's given me so much confidence now on the other side of this you know because often when we're praying for a person we look all we do is we see that person and we think that person could never come to christ 
that person would have to lose everything. It, it would be terrible. I don't know that we can handle it. That person could never, she could never get there. And sometimes you feel like you're singing a solo, but, but please, Lord, could you make it happen? And then you realize you're not singing. Prayer is never a solo. You know, it's never a solo. It's it, at, at the very least, it's a duet because the Lord Jesus Christ says that he intercedes with the prayers of his people. But more often than not, it's a pretty wide chorus of people, you know, praying with you for your lost loved ones. So, um, you know, there are, so there are a lot of questions. When I came to Christ, I didn't stop feeling like a lesbian. No, I didn't. When I came to Christ, I came to Christ because I knew one thing and one thing only, and that's that Jesus Christ is real and risen and alive. Mm -hmm. um, and it all just kind of worked out from there. Um, but um, I, I was in a very faithful church, right? Yeah. With, very, with a very faithful pastor and a pastor's wife who never tired of discipling me. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I was high maintenance. <laughs> So the, by that time you had actually started going to church, but um, yeah, what's so remarkable about your story. And as you read your book, um, the gospel comes with the house key. I, I just couldn't help but think that this, you talk about radically, radically ordinary hospitality. And that's what we're going to, mm -hmm. we're, we're going to get to that in a minute, but I couldn't help but think as I'm reading your book, Rosaria, that a, uh, a big piece of why you have what some people, especially in the American church would say, well, that's radical hospitality is, is the way that you came to know Jesus. And it was through this couple right. continuing to open their home week after week to let you in, to let you sit and eat a meal, mm -hmm. ask your questions, but also you're just it's the conversation, but also it's the, it's the eating together. And what you said, what Christian families sometimes take for granted as, well, this is just our normal life. And that's not normal life for a no. lot of people. And so the hospitality that they offered to you was how they really presented Christ to you. You know, so often in, in American circles, it's like to witness to your neighbor means you invite them to church on Sunday. You as a feminist lesbian professor would have never gone into a church, you know, but, but you were willing to come and have dinner at this couple's house. So uh, do you think that like thinking about this book and how it is radical to some people, do you think the way you came to the Lord. And I think just your early discipleship was just, Hey, Rosaria, this is the Christian life. Right. You know, this is how we're supposed to live. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and you know, I, the, the gay community, especially the gay community in New York, especially the gay community in New York in the nineties, when the uh, AIDS virus is just, you know, running, you know, ramp, literally rampage through our, our community. That also was a community given to, um, I don't wanna call it uh, hospitality because hospitality is a particular Christian idea, but definitely a kind of identitarian community. Mm -hmm. And so in, in, my, in my lesbian community, someone's home was open every single night of the week uh, for food, for fellowship, to just talk through the hardships of the day. So, so when Ken and Floyd invited me to their home, that actually felt safe. If they had, inv had invited me to church, I would have presumed they just wanted to fix me up and send me off, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, but, but I didn't feel like a project. I felt like a neighbor. Yeah. So let's, let's get into this then. Like one thing you talk about, like Aaron was saying, this radical, ordinary hospitality. And I'd, I'd love to get into, give us a definition for that. And also what it's not, like you talk about counterfeit hospitality, you kind of alluded to that with the gay community, but um, let's dive into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, with, in our post COVID world, you know, we, we didn't actually stop practicing hospitality. I guess I should just, you know, out myself on this. I was not, I was not arrested in my apron. Um, if it, if I were, you know, I'd have a good shot with that, but, but I wasn't, but, uh, but, you know, we, we had to, we had to measure what we were being told, right, about 
not gathering. And we decided that was probably not a good idea. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you what parameters we set and, and all that kind of stuff if you want to know. But basically, um, if you read through the Gospels, you'll notice that Jesus literally eats his way through the Gospels. Mm -hmm. I mean, he just does. I mean, he just eats his way through the Gospels. <laughs> um, and and um, there's only one way that we know of to, to dine. I know that we're dining with sinners because we're at the table. So it's like it's a guarantee. We're dining with sinners. Rosario's there. <laughs> we're dining with sinners. Um, but it, a home is a beautiful place. A Christian home is a beautiful place. And it's a, it's a beautiful place unlike any other place in the whole wide world. And your unsaved neighbors have never seen it or experienced it hmm. ever. And so, um, you know, Kent, when we got married, Kent was a church planter. And so a lot of what I talk about in gospel comes with the house key is just kind of, you know, like the church planners who read that book and the missionaries who read that book just say, you know, ho hum, <laughs> you know, <laughs> of course, of course. Um, but basically it means that that um, you make a commitment to loving the stranger, to not just loving the stranger theoretically, because, you know, strangers don't actually fall from the sky, but seeking the stranger, going somewhere where you're not and the stranger is, seeking the stranger, helping to help that stranger become a neighbor. And if God so wills, watch that neighbor become part of the family of God. And, and that is the, that's the posture of radical hospitality. And so to break that down a little bit, you know, here in middle-class America where strangers don't fall from the sky, if you're going to find a stranger, you have to, you have to put yourself in some stranger's path. And so, so there are lots of things you could do. Um, one of the things that, that, that we have, um, that we've done in the past that we'll hope to do again in the future is be part of an organization called Safe Families for Children. Mm -hmm. And that is a whole family care, Christian response to foster, uh, to foster care. Kent and I have adopted four children. Two of the children we adopted at the age of 17. We did that five years apart. So we, we have been part of the adoption um, community. It's a triangle, really, the adoption triangle for many, many years dealing with very, you know, traumatized children at, at many ages and levels. And so the, um, so safe family is a wonderful way to meet people that you're not going to meet, uh, probably at your church. Um, mm -hmm. but to also then meet them in a very intimate way, because what safe family does is it provides a home where certainly children are safe, but in our case, we've actually had the privilege of, of having an entire displaced a family displaced by homelessness living with us who mm -hmm. uh, turned out to be brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Very humbling, very humbling to realize yeah. that you are, you are just entertaining strangers, you know, angels unaware that you thought were strangers. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, so at this point, basically, if you tried to tell the Butterfield children who live in this house that there's such a thing called stranger danger, they would laugh at you. But, you know, <laughs> that's another story. Maybe we'll talk about that. But um, but really working hard to seek the stranger. And another thing that we discovered is that um, it might strangers might not be people who live, you know, the other side of town. They might be the people in the house with the where you know you, you kind of know there's trouble, but you don't know what's going on. And so another thing that we have done is uh, designate one night of the week or even one night of the month where we have the equivalent of a Christian open house. And what I mean by that is uh, sometimes we call it Fire Pit Fridays. Uh, we just put it up on the next door app. We invite everybody to come. We're going to have a cookout. And um, and other times, you know, in the winter, we'll have people, in, you know, inside the house. I live in North Carolina, so we don't have a lot of winter, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what's nice about that is there's, a, again, a, a kind of Christian posture. You know, there's the prayer before the meal, there's the meal, and then there's the gathering after the meal where um, Kent will open the word for us and uh, we'll sing a psalm and we'll read a passage of scripture or maybe a whole chapter. And then Kent will ask for prayer requests. And, you know, your unsaved neighbors have two very good questions, right? And it's the questions that all covenant children have too, but they, you know, they know probably not to ask it. You know, one is how long will this take, right? <laughs> and the other is, do I have to pray out loud? <laughs> um, 
And and so, you know, again, we haven't, we just haven't had anybody just like flee from our table when we say, well, we're going to have family devotions now and we'd like you to stay. Um, we've all talked about hard things. And what we're going to do now is go to the throne of grace and we're going to take all those hard things and we're going to leave them at the foot of the Lord um, and we're going to pray about them and then we're going to go on and we're not going to fret about them. Um, and, you know, even that is a really crazy idea to a lot of people. What do you mean I'm not going to fret? Hmm. How, how, what do you mean I'm going to leave? You know, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. um, the, and the reason that we found it's helpful to not, to, to be very regular about these things, not, not be too fussy. I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying we're going to have a Christmas party or we're going to have a Thanksgiving party. That's great. But, but we have just found the, a weekly rhythm is really helpful because your neighbors who are, who are really burdened um, by addictions or by abuse really don't know when they're going to be sober or safe. They just don't. Hmm. So if it's every Friday night, you know what, one of those Fridays, they're going to show up. Mm -hmm. You, so. the way you're describing it is, yeah, I think people wrestle with this sounds crazy to, well, that kind of sounds simple. <laughs> and and yeah. you call this kind of hospitality, the the ABC Christianity, that this isn't PhD Christianity. This hmm. is really the basic ABCs that I think actually some of us who maybe grew up in the church didn't learn those ABCs of this kind of hospitality. But what you're describing, I think it's good for me to hear. I think it's good for us to hear because, and you describe it in the book too. Your house is not always clean. Your meals are not, you know, French complicated meals. You serve a lot of soup and bread and you're laughing rice because you're beans. like, how on earth could I do that? It's a lot of yeah. rice and beans. It's a Crazy. lot of just, Hey, pull up the stool. Cause we're out of chairs or there's always grass outside that you can sit on. And it's like what you're describing. If you really listen is just an openness to people to the regular life of a person and the regular life of someone who's seeking to follow Christ. And I, I wanted to ask you about, yeah, how you guys, cause you, you have meals and then that awkwardness that maybe comes with saying, okay, now we're going to open the scriptures. And even if it's just to read a Psalm and then pray or whatever, but you really just keep it simple. Don't you guys like, it's not like you're yeah. preparing or getting curriculum and doing some kind of fancy thing. And I would love for you just to maybe talk a little bit more of how simple you really do keep this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, everything around here is simple. And, um, <laughs> and, and you know, the gospel is simple. Mm -hmm. um, the gospel yeah. is simple. And, and, um, and, and I would just say, you know, I'm the queen of awkward. <laughs> so I don't, the fact that this feels awkward just means I'm breathing. I'm alive. I have a pulse, right? You know, like, I, yeah, it's always awkward. Life is awkward. Well, I, tell, it's awkward. I have a motto about that. I think that yeah. you'll appreciate. I tell okay. my girls all the time that, um, we can feel awkward about this later. Like I've yeah. just decided, I just decide like, okay, I'm not gonna feel awkward about this. I'll feel yeah. awkward about it later. Yeah. So they yeah. laugh at me about that, but it sounds like you, you've got that motto too. Yeah. Yeah. I just, it's just how it is. And, you know, and, and, and people are going to say things in your house that you're like, hmm, wasn't quite prepared <laughs> for that one. <laughs> you know. And, um, but you know, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is. And, and I think the other thing I want to add to this is that a major group of people that I love and care for, and they know it, are children. Hmm. And so it is always the case that we are overrun with children who have not washed their hands. Uh, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We, it, it, they are, they are, they are the the lifeblood of hospitality. And so, for hmm. you know, my my children know that. My children know the question to the answer can so-and-so come over is yes. And even if that is, even if that question is asked as we're packing up to go to church camp, um, you know, I, I'll, I, then I'll just, then I have, I have done this. I'll call the mom and I'll say, listen, we're heading out to church camp. Is it okay if we take Bill for a week? Uh, you know, I'll, can you sign the release form? I mean, you know, cause we're just, if you need our help, we're not here this week. 
but we can take him. And we have, Mm -hmm. you know, we have, it's not. So, so what, what, what I would say is you want to keep it simple. And that's because you need to keep your eyes open Mm -hmm. so that you can see what the Lord is doing. Mm -hmm. See, the Lord is not watching you follow a complicated recipe. The Lord is doing something called saving a people for himself. And the Lord never gets the address wrong. So he puts you around all these people. And so if you're too busy, you know, kind of like Narcissus staring at your reflection in the mirror or whatever it is you're staring at, you're not, you're, you're, you're not alert to what the Lord wants you to look at. These are eternal souls Mm -hmm. and they are, it's, it's amazing, right? Go ahead. I'm sorry, Sarah. Sorry. I thought you were pausing because I wanted to say like, that is so, um, that's demanding. People are demanding right? And, and, um, and exhausting. And I know from your book that you're an introvert Mm -hmm. and which just blows my mind, but, um, but okay. Take us to, you can't just do hospitality to be nice to people. You're going to run out of the niceness. So tell us about the foundation in your mind. Cause you talk about this in the book and I think it's so powerful and so important because, we can't just go out there and think I'm going to be nice to my neighbors because we yeah. are not nice. We're right. just not nice. No, no, so, no, no. So tell me what, it, what's the foundation? Yeah. The, I mean, definitely the foundation is that you are Christians on a mission field. And, um, and if you're like me, I'm, I'm a homeschool mom. Um, you know, it, it, there's this weird, there's this, you know, just, weird rumor going around that I leave the house a lot, but you know, I really don't, I I don't even do door to door evangelism. I do, it's called open the door evangelism. You know, it's like, I've invited you over now come in, you know, so we can talk. Um, um, But you know, how can I forget my own history? I'm not entitled to all this grace and glory. How in the world did I get here? I think about that every Lord's day. It's the, it's my favorite day of the week. How did I get here? Well, I got here because the Lord put it upon Ken Smith's heart to go after me. And I don't mean that in some weird predatory way, but I mean this in a, in, in a vigilant way. I mean, that he, he, he didn't forget me. He didn't have one dinner with me and say, well, that was interesting. I wonder, honey, who are we having over next week? You know, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't like that. Christians don't throw people away. The world does. So sometimes people do exhaust me um, and it's, um, but you know, it's a lot worse to be, to be lonely and to be lost Mm -hmm. than it is to be saved and exhausted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it just is. And so I think what we need to have is we need to be really countercultural about this. Mm -hmm. We need to to love people well enough to, to just not think that this is all about us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I don't have any right to all this grace and glory and neither do any of you. Yeah. Your, <laughs> the book, your book was so good because it is, it is convicting, not in a way where I think, Oh, you know, shoot, I've, I've messed up. I got to do all these things, but it is convicting in what, what Sarah's talking about. Like, people do exhaust us or, or Mm -hmm. like you mentioned in your book, you're actually an introvert. And so Mm -hmm. you need time, which you do in the morning Mm -hmm. where you are with the Lord, where you have Mm -hmm. quiet, where you're preparing for the day in, in Mm -hmm. quietness before the rest of your house is awake. That's Mm -hmm. how you nurture this unique soul that you have that Mm -hmm. God's created. And so, but in the book, the, the one quote that just really, really convicted me is you say, we soberly know that God calls us to bear heavy and hard crosses, self denials that feel like death. We trust God's power more than we trust our limitations. And we know that he never gives a command without giving the grace to perform it. And that to me just really summed up your book. Well, of we are called to look beyond our own limitations Mm -hmm. and look to his power. So when we open up our homes, when we do different things, we aren't doing it out of 
oh, this is our gifting, or this is, this is, you know, how I'm really strong in this. So I'll do this. It's actually out of our brokenness, our limitations, right. our weaknesses that God it gives us the strength that we need to do what he's called us to do. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would say that when we open our homes as Christians, there are two things on display and it's not our meal. It's not the meal. It's not whether the dishes match. Mm -hmm. It's not whether the kids are clean. That's just not it. It's the gospel that will be presented both in word and in deed. But I would say the high mark for us is really when we are ha- gathering around the table, we are lingering at the table, we are opening the Bible, we are discussing it. You know, my children have fallen asleep under a table. This is, you know, true confession, listening to their parents beg their neighbors to put their faith in Christ. Mm. And there's no question about how to do it because that's like a, it's like a, it's a first language. They know how to do these things. So so that's the the one thing. But the other thing that is on display is the Christian family, is the submitted wife and the protective husband and the way that Christ and the church are are reflected in that. That is craziness to this world, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and yet, yet, yet we, 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 yet it's the very thing that the world needs to see because, um, two things, seeing is often believing, but also seeing has a way of decompressing some of the dangerous myths that are out there. Mm -hmm. And I would add one more thing about the table. The table is not the church. And so at the table, you have people who have different opinions and they have different lives and they have different values. Um, I have been at my table when a well-known Christian has texted and said, have you read so-and-so's book? She talks about you in the first chapter and I think you should review it for my journal. And I'll text back and say, well, I can't because so-and-so is sitting at the table with me and we'll talk about that. (laughs) Okay, you know, see, the table values privacy. Mm -hmm. It values the importance of um, because that's that's where that's where the no shame repentance comes in. The no shame repentance comes in because this is a private conversation at my dinner table. No one is going to tweet about it. Nobody's going to write a blog about it. Nobody, you know, you're safe. Okay, this is this is we're just whatever the Lord will have for you is the most important thing, mm-hmm. but we're gonna tell the truth. Um, and, and the truth can be very painful, but we're neighbors. And we've been doing this thing called lingering at the dinner table for years now. And so our friendship is as strong as our words, but our words are pretty strong. Somebody walking in for the first time might, you know, might be a little, hmm, <laughs> you know, the coffee's a little strong around here. It is, <laughs> it is but we love each other. And you can't just write each other off when you're sitting down and eating together. No. Living next to each other. No, you, because you're depending upon each other. And because your, 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 your maturity as a Christian has gone beyond the, 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 the platitudes, you know, you, you can say without any difficulty that the neighbors across the street who identify as lesbian are really good neighbors and you love them Mm -hmm. and you can say that you can teach your children to be respectful and appreciate the all the common grace that comes from across the street as mature christians we know the difference we know that there is a shared sameness but also a significant um, difference between goodness and holiness and so we can appreciate the goodness of our neighbors who identify as lesbian, all the good things that come from their house, the apple pies and the, and the, the dog walks and uh, the picnics uh, without, without calling that holy, because it's not holy. We serve a holy God and we want our neighbors wh- whom we love and whose goodness we see. We want them to know that there is a Lord in heaven who has, who has died on a cross, which has given to everyone who puts our trust in him, the power to die to ourselves when what we do stands 
in direct violation of what his call is for our life. Mm. And I know that people think you can't talk this way, but we do it every night. So I know that's just not true. I think that this is what happens when you have a whole generation of people who spend their life thinking social media is real. Mm -hmm. It's real, it's real stupid is what it is, but it, it's, it's, not, it's not real. Um, and and I, can just, I can just count you know, anecdote after anecdote of what it means to have a private conversation with someone where I'll say, now listen, I know that we're friends and so I need you to hear this about my history so that you know two things. One is I completely understand what you are all about. And the other is we're not standing in the same place. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, I've had people say, well, that, you know, you can't possibly be friends. Just the opposite. I just, just recently had a, a young colleague, at, I, I deliver food, you know, on Tuesdays and, and Thursdays, that's my day job uh, uh, in mm -hmm. the morning. And um, I had a young colleague had this conversation with her and she said, I wish you could be my mother. And I said, well, aren't you offended that I think that this is, you know, that, that sin is, no, just the fact that I'm understood means everything to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you see where it goes. Like, don't, take the risk of awkward, take the risk of honesty, take the risk of believing that the Lord's people are everywhere. And there is this category called the unconverted elect, <laughs> right? You know, they're out there. Um, and I think what sometimes happens is if we've been, if we're too careful or if we've been raised in churches that actually think you're supposed to work from your gifts, that's, that's nonsense. You know, your gifts are filthy rags. So are mine. God may use them, but he, he may, he may not. He, he may use something else. He may use our awkwardness. He may use things that don't, don't function as gifts, but but if, if you think that, that you, you, know, you, you can only work from your gifts, you might think, oh, we better get a paid um, you know, evangelist on the staff here. You know, notice we have an unbeliever at the table. Where's our evangelist? You know, and that's just crazy. But what your neighbor wants to know is your heart. Your neighbor wants to know why you believe Jesus is real and risen and safe and profound. Why you tremble at the word of God and yet also, also live to read it every day. They want to know from from you, um, you're the person they have a relationship with. But I think too often in the church, we ask the Holy Spirit to do our job. We say, oh Lord, please save the Jones family. They're such an awesome family. I don't wanna to talk to them till they're Christians, but you go save them. And then once you do, you know, I'll have them over for dinner. Well, don't ask the Holy Spirit to do your job. He's, he's pretty clear on boundaries and he's not gonna do that. Yeah, exactly. So when, when we talk about hospitality, the first thing that comes to people's mind most of the time is, oh, I have to have a family over for dinner. And, and while that is certainly part of it, and there's, you can't leave that out. Right. But I think hospitality is so much bigger than that. And I know that you think that as well. Um, and I, well, as I was thinking and praying about the interview, I thought about, um, this is a totally out of the box example of how hospitality played out in my life in one instance. Okay. So I was looking for the stranger. Um, and I joined the public arts commission in our town, Ooh. Colorado Springs. Cause so I thought, I mean, I love beauty. We could find that in common. Right. And I was really hopeful that I would go in there and make all kinds of relationships with all kinds of strangers. And I would change their life because I would introduce them to Jesus and they would be never the same again. And it didn't quite happen that way. Um, but <laughs> surprise, but what I was frustrated at first, like it's so hard to build a relationship because we're seeing each other once a month and um, I keep forgetting people's names. They don't remember me. We come in, we talk about art that the city is going to acquire and this kind of thing. Well, so it didn't take me long to figure out some tools. And so I wrote down people's names where they were sitting. And then before I would go to the okay. next meeting, I would review the names and right. I'd walk in and make sure I said, hello, Sandy or whatever. Right. And, right. and then, then I started writing down conversations because I would always ask a question like, what are you looking forward to this month? Or um, what are you working on? What's your favorite project? So one month I asked Sandy in particular um, what he was working on and he was 
finishing up some sculptures, sculptures for a sculpture garden. And so the next month, this was so cool. The next month I said, Sandy, how did the sculptures turn out? And he was shocked that I remembered. We never got to an amazing conversation, but I worked on that, or I was on that committee for three years. And I mean, now what I would probably do is have them over, but um, Mm -hmm. I didn't. Um, And I did try to have them to my church, which was a block away, but uh nobody wanted to come. So whatever. I was going to do happy hour at my church, but Uh, that that sounds great. But anyway, I I guess I just want to say like, um, maybe speak to that out of the box because it really is a posture you alluded to that it's a posture Mm -hmm. so if it's a posture it happens outside our home as well as inside our home Mm -hmm. absolutely so speak to that yeah yeah and and i love sarah i love what you said about remembering people's names writing them down um in in the art of neighboring which is one of my favorite books about all of this uh dave runyon talks about um you know, just keep, you just keep going deeper. You know, at first you write down the names of the, the, the kids and the dogs, right? And, the, and then you get to know the parents' names and then you get to know a little bit more about um, what their needs are. And the whole time you're praying for them. You know, you have lists of people you pray for uh, that are people that aren't in your real world. Um, um, and you see them as human. You, you, and you, you, you see the you see the needs that they have, but you also, I mean, what I would just say is that once you get to another, you know, a deeper place in your friendship, Mm -hmm. you let them help you, Hmm. you know, like that's what friends do. There's a reciprocity of care Mm -hmm. in a friendship. Mm -hmm. So you let them help you and you thank them for their help. In the book you talked about, when you were talking about hospitality, that was one part that really convicted me because I think about when I host people here in my home, it can be exhausting Mm -hmm. if I don't share in the workload and you're big on allowing your neighbors, you know, big quote neighbors, whoever it is, is in your Mm -hmm. home, letting them help you to load the dishwasher or fold the laundry that's still on the couch before dinner starts or you know and uh, oftentimes people will say oh can I help and oh no no let me do it is my first instinct to say but you actually say you know true hospitality is in sharing life together and so this idea what you're saying is really it convicted me and thought I thought okay this is how I can become more and more hospitable is letting people share in, in the workload. And you're talking about true friendship, which of course, that means we bear one another's burdens, right? Right. Yeah. Aaron's vacuumed at my house. So that's fine. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) And, And I would say have, have a list of tasks that when people say, how can I help you that you say, yeah, awesome here. You know, like I'll say, Yes. Um, can you chop the vegetables for the soup or can, yes. you know, here's the, you know, what's the, and, you know, kids can help too. I mean, mm-hmm. I, and it's hilarious watching kids help. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, we had the kids fairly recently just do all of the cleanup. And I mean, like, it's wild in the kitchen. I'm hearing screaming and laughter and I come in and I, there's, like on the ceiling, you know, there's oh soap gosh. and, you know, and so I come in and I say, well, where are the leftovers? And they said, oh, you know, Calvin and Will came over and they hadn't eaten yet. So we fed them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just like, so, so, you know, why waste a Tupperware when you've just got two sausages and you've got neighbor kids who just, you know, rode their bike over, yeah, you know, one just, less dish to clean, one less <laughs> dish, you know? And so I, um, yeah, I, I just, I, I think that there's great joy in, um, there's great joy in that. There's great joy in, in um, breaking down other people's anxiety, because if you think that it's anxious to be a host, mm-hmm. it's actually, it's more anxiety ridden to be a guest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If, you know, a host, your turf, your home, you know what you're doing. A guest has no idea, especially a guest in a, you know, in a home that, you know, Christians are, are held in ill repute, right? Mm-hmm. We are the haters. We are the dangerous people. Um, um, you've got to be able to have a way to have your neighbors kind of sort of say that and ask you about that. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I, I mean, really, and you've got to be able to have a way of answering that. Mm-hmm. And I think it like the language we use is so important too. Like I used to say, I'm sorry, my house is such a mess, but I've changed that to, Hey, my house is super lived in, but I want to see you. So come over or, you know, so even just changing our wording. Yeah. I think the language we use and, and also just our mindset of what hospitality is. And as I went through your book, Rosaria, I wrote down all the different stories you tell, because it's not just about you know, what happens around the dinner table, although it's not less than that either, but you just, all the stories you give in your book under what hospitality is, is of course, having people to your table, but it's also bringing meals to people, which you mentioned you do. It's giving rides. It's watching people's pets. It's walking their dogs. It's writing letters. It's visiting someone in jail. It's lending your car. It's giving a place to stay when it is needed. It's sitting at the bedside of someone who's sick or dying. Um, It's opening up your home to have conversations about heated political or cultural things going on. I mean, you cast the net so wide that that I think helps to paint this picture of what, what you really are talking about is, is what the Christian life should be just a normal part of our Christian life, which leads me to the question that as when we posted on Facebook and, and Instagram, that we were going to talk to you the question. And we said, Hey, what do you want us to ask Rosaria? The number one question was, okay, how do I do hospitality in a marriage or a family with someone who's not really keen on it? And, Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking of Rosaria, the you know, the wife or the husband who enjoys opening their home and the other one doesn't, or we have a lot of young listeners. So a college student whose parents don't really like to have people in the home, but, but she wants to be hospitable. So how do you, how do we be hospitable when we are sharing a home Mm -hmm. with people who at least at first are like, absolutely not. (laughs) That's a great question. And the number one thing is to realize where hospitality falls in the life of the church. You see, hospitality is not a Butterfield mission. It's a church mission. Mm -hmm. Our our house is a good outpost for now. It might not be two years from now. It wasn't when my my mom was sick and dying in a living room. Like, you know, it just wasn't, right? Um, So, so hospitality is a little bit like, um, like, like door to door evangelism. Are you going to tell the mom who's, you know, breastfeeding and has a two year old that she really, she should just be doing door to door evangelism. No, no, you're not going to do that. Is evangelism important? Yes. But if she's a faithful covenant member of a church, then the, then Joe's evangelism is credited to her. It's credited to her righteousness. We are one body. And so the first is to remember that hospitality is a, it's a body issue. It's not a, um, you know, it's not a Smith thing or a Butterfield thing um, or a Stone Street thing. It's just, that's just not it. Now, in the case of the wife who wants to practice hospitality and the husband who doesn't, the most God honoring thing you can do is respect your husband and not. Okay, that, that would be a really respectful, very, 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 mature Christian thing to do. But in addition to that, what you can do is go be a helper at the house that is practicing hospitality. And so what I would say is that the church doesn't need every house in the church to be an outpost, but a couple of them would be awesome. Mm -hmm. And what we do need is every Christian uh, at one of those outposts. It's extremely helpful. For, uh, for, you know what, it's also extremely helpful for safety's sake. We haven't talked about this, but what about a bunch of strangers in your house and little kids? You gotta have some rules and you need to have some bouncers. So it's really good to have many, many hands from the church at these different outposts. So, so the, two quest- the two answers would be um, wives respect your husbands and, and, and certainly don't fight over this. But then two, think about this, make this, pray about this as a church mission 
and go to where the outpost is and you will be really helpful there. I, I so depend upon my people who are here at my outpost um, regularly. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Well, I'd love to add one thing to that, if, if I might. Um, I think having that posture of prayer too, that, I mean, you kind of talked about that, but listening and, and again, it's not limited to the table, although it's not less than the table, but thinking outside the box, could you meet at a park with other moms? Could you, yes. could you meet at a coffee shop? I mean, like even that's yes. hospitable is opening yourself towards relationship Absolutely. towards caring. So I think, I think that I would just add that to it too. You got to think outside the box and um, may I, may I add something to of that? Course, yeah. And I would say you need to think covenantally, which means that what is the, how does this work for the whole family? Mm -hmm. um, we've never practiced hospitality when the kids are in bed. They've always been part of it, mm -hmm. which has meant for years when they were little, it was lunch, not dinner. Or it was the park, not our dining room table. But you can bring Bibles and Psalters to the park. It's not, you know, it's not that hard. You can, you're, you know, so, so to think covenantally about this mm -hmm. and to realize that, you know, every, every person in your family is needed. How do you know that your infant is not going to be the very person that the Lord is going to use to bring your aged neighbor to Christ? Mm -hmm. Don't presume okay. that wouldn't be the case. One more funny story about the Public Arts Commission, because I got pregnant in the middle of that. Um, and I thought, oh, I kind of had this moment of sinfulness. Actually, it was nine months of sinfulness that God rooted out tons of things in my heart. But anyway, um, one of the things was I thought, oh, I just got involved in things like the Art Commission. And this is going to like sideline me for a long time because my older kids are older. And so mm -hmm. this was a little surprise attack. But um was hilarious because the I went in the first month I went in and I was actually showing that I was mm -hmm. pregnant the president of the committee hugged me and Aww. said you are the cutest pregnant lady Aww. and I mean I just That's he said sweet. it so genuine like it wasn't you know I just took it as such a huge compliment and he talked to me every single week every single month and was, it was like an instant connection. I was like, wow, I did not see that coming. Anyway, okay, we got to move on to our, our ending questions. Um, okay. What would your advice be for young people? We have a lot of young listeners and we, we love to ask our guests to just speak to them in particular. Yeah, well, I would say that what I would love for young women to do is to commit themselves to faithful Bible reading, faithful prayer, and a high regard for the high value of growing up to be a wife and a mother, to value what it means to make home your priority. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have other jobs. Look, you're listening to a podcast with a lot of women who've got a lot, Do we do a lot of things, but home is our priority. In fact, all the things we do, we do because they bless the home. And if we started doing jobs that weren't a blessing to our home, our husbands would each gently say to us, this is taking us a field of where we need to go. So make, make the calling, the high calling of being a wife and a mother, something that you value even if it's not something that the Lord has for you. But if you're a young person, you don't know yet. So that is what I would say. And the other thing I would say is know what you know, but also try to discern what the myths are out there about being a Christian woman that are not true. And don't believe things that aren't true. And I know that sounds really simple, but if you want to think about it, what was Eve's, what was Eve's first sin? Her first sin was believing a lie. It's actually a sin to be deceived. It's a sin to be deceived. I know, I know what it feels like to be deceived and you feel like a victim. You feel like you were just abducted by some alien force to do something you didn't think you were going to do and you did it anyway. And that's certainly how it feels, but at least from God's perspective, if you believe a lie, you are sinning. And so don't believe the lies. 
there are a lot of lies out there, a lot of lies that 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 the the probably the older women in your church and the older women in your family might be able to answer. I know I could certainly answer them, but some of these lies are, are, are raging and they're dividing the church and you need to know that it's a lie. You need to, and, and you don't have to get on, you know, you don't have to make a big stink about it. You just have to not believe the lie. Mm -hmm. You can do that quietly and respectfully but I've come up with about nine myths and I'm working on a, on a book about this. I've got nine myths that women are very quick to believe and it has been the danger. It's been a danger to our churches and to our families. Wow, that's really good advice. And I, I'm excited about your new book, The Nine Myths, and we might have to have you back on to talk about <laughs> that book again, because that that sounds really good. Um, and something that we talk about on the podcast a lot about the ideas, the culture is pushing to us about how, who we are as women and, and what God and contrasting that with the truth and being pursuers of truth, like you're saying. Um, okay. We love books on this podcast. We love your book and, and we love to talk about books. So can you tell us what books I, I assume you're reading several books, you're a homeschooling mom. So I assume you have lots of books going on, but what book is by your nightstand yeah. right now, or are you is on your mind right now? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> she's prepared. She's yeah, I, am. I, I pulled step. it from my nightstand. So I, I'm a reader, but I'm actually a re-reader. You should know this. Okay. Like I, I, I don't, it doesn't count if you read it once, but these are the books that I've read once. Um, this book is, is simply awesome. It's called Primal Screams, How the Sexual Revolution Created Identity Politics. Is that Mary Eberstadt? It is. Yeah. I am rereading because I, I've, I've already blurbed this book, but I'm rereading it because I'm writing a review of it. Um, Carl Schumann's book, The Rise and Triumph, of the modern self. Mm -hmm. Super awesome, awesome, awesome book. And then at night, my bedtime reading before I go to sleep is uh, C.S. Lewis's The Silver Chair. Okay, right. well, our last question, and I just have to apologize to our listeners who, um, well, like Aaron said, we put on Facebook and Instagram, hey, we're talking to Rosaria. Do you guys have any questions? And we got so many questions and um, we could keep going for at least another hour. I know that. I know. But um, to those listeners who we did not get to your questions, maybe we'll add them to our question and answer time um, that Aaron and I will host coming up soon. Um, but anyway, all right, last question, Rosaria. Um, if you could have coffee with any woman from history, who would it be? Okay, this is kind of a crazy answer, but I have been obsessed my whole life with the work of Mary Shelley, who is oh, the author of Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Yeah, yeah. She is the daughter of two revolutions, the French one and the feminist one. Hmm. And married to an atheist, I believe probably died an atheist, although a skeptic. Mm -hmm. And I, I have a million questions for her. I think she probably drank tea, not coffee, but that's okay. I'd do it. Yes. <laughs> well, Rosaria, thank you so much uh, for being on the podcast. And I just, I really do want to thank you for your book. I think, mm -hmm. and, and I encourage our listeners to get the book and from read it, read it from the beginning to the end. If, if you start to read it and you feel challenged the way I did, keep reading because Rosaria is a real person. She admits when she should have said something and she doesn't, or should have had a conversation. You're just very open and honest. And, um, and actually I want to mention too, that I, I have your, the book, but I also, I listen to it on audio and, um, you record it and the, and you also sing some of the Thank Psalms you. in yeah. the recording. And oh, when you were talking about being at your mother's side in hospice, the last few days of her life mm -hmm. and the story of how you got to lead her to the Lord mm -hmm. and you were singing the Psalms you sang to her, that was just so touching to me. And oh. it just really ministered to me. So Listeners, if you want to listen to the book, have Rosaria read her book to you. It is an absolute <laughs> treat to listen to. Oh, and I just so appreciate bad. the way you challenge us as Christians to 
really embrace a life that is open to the lost. And um, so anyway, thank you for your book and for your time. And uh, we just appreciate you as a sister in Christ. Oh, thank you so much. I feel the same about both of you. Thank you for the work that you're doing. May the Lord use all of this to his glory. 